Hi there, everyone. Um, my name is Natish, and basically, we're going to have this panel talk on Beyond Can You Mentor Me? Crafting the Contribution Letter. So um, the approach for this talk, like we got an idea was like, if you look at this graph, over the period of time, we have noticed like a lot of times um, contributors come to a project, they generally stick to a project for a while, and maybe due to some other work happening around, they got busy with some stuff, they eventually leave the project after a certain point of time. And basically this graph is showing like over a period of time, if you consider the number of years, a lot of projects are losing its contributors. Not every project, but most of the projects try to lose its contributor, and it, this could be like a lot of reasons so far. So, um, and there can be various reasons. Uh, for example, someone who is getting started in contributing to a project, maybe he does not know how to contribute well to a project. He can tr maybe try to find some ways. Or maybe there's like not a proper sort of mentorship that could be provided to that particular person. So with this kind of uh, panel discussion, we're going to taking a look at um, what are the things like Kubernetes project or maybe some other projects does differently that makes the contributor stick to the project? What are the, some of the mentorship opportunities these projects generally offer? Um, this panel discussion consists of the steering committee members and the maintainers, and we really look forward to have this panel discussion started onwards. So let's start with the introduction. Uh, I'll quickly start with mine first. Uh, my name is Nitesh. I am a final year undergrad. Basically, you can consider me as one of the mentees, and here are the mentors sitting there. Um, I work at AQD as a software engineering intern. Uh, I was also a former LFX mentee, and I'm also a CNCF ambassador. So I'll hand over the introduction to the mentors now. Hey, everybody. So my name is Jared. Uh, so I have had the pleasure of being a mentor through some of the official programs. I got the, to go through them and remember them all when I was counting them up before the slide here. So I've got to do that at least six times. Um, and then there's you know, a whole bunch of unofficial mentorships as well. Uh, I spend most of my time as uh, you know, one of the creators of both the Rook project and the Crossplane project as well, both projects that are donated to the CNCF, one graduated and one waiting to graduate for a, a few months now. Let's just say we're not going to count them. Um, but yeah, so I spend most of my time working on those two projects uh, in the, in the, within the CNCF landscape. Hello, everyone. My name is Wenjia. I am the co-chair of SIG SCD. I also work as an engineering manager at Google. We work on GKE and open source SCD and Kubernetes. Uh, so I worked on SCD since um, 2017, and there was a project, it's a like, standalone project, um, belong to CoreOS at the time, and then it was donated to um, CNCF and now become a, a Kubernetes SIG. Um, and I was, I, uh, I've been on both sides of the mentorship. I was um, mentee, like probably like most of the people here, or a lot of people here. Um, um, I was definitely a mentee when I started, and then I had, like, I'm fortunate to have several, like, really great mentors um, in my career, GP, GP Betts, um, Logical Hound, Lava Lamp, um, and a lot more, and that um, shaped my career, and I'm really grateful. And I, um, last year we ran the SED's first cohort of mentorship program. It was very successful. One year after, uh, looking back, we have we grown the next generation of um, SED maintainers, um, approvers, reviewers, subproject leads. Um, so yeah, I'm glad to share my experience here. Hi, uh, my name is Carol Valencia. Uh, my relations is also I was a mentee and a mentor. Uh, I started in doing the translations for the website for Kubernetes. And uh, they helped me a lot to, to be to start to do my first pull request. And uh, after that also I participate in the SIG release that they also they have an official program to be a shadow and learn about the process. So this kind of experience is about more known coding. Uh, is a way that you can help uh, with the translations. It's about more uh, trying to help uh, with the different localizations and the language that we have. Uh, and in the SIG release is more a project management, this kind of experience. So I think that is 
uh, my involvement about mentor and mentoring in Kubernetes. Hey all, uh, is the mic working? Not working. I'll, I'll take this one. Um, hi everyone, I'm Nabarun. Um, I am a Kubernetes maintainer, a chair of uh, Kubernetes SIG Contribex. And I have also been on the Kubernetes steering committee, and now I'm an Emeritus member. Um, my Kubernetes journey started like around five years back, uh, maybe a little bit more than that. Uh, I also started being a, a new contributor, uh, started contributing to release and sick contribex back then. And before that, I was a practitioner and started utilizing Kubernetes. Um, so in this panel, we will share some of our highlights from our journey and how we have grown and we have helped grow other people through structured programs and other initiatives. Thanks for all your introduction. So um, I'll start with the first one. So I want all of you maybe to quickly maybe go through your personal experience with mentorship in the maybe the Kubernetes community and uh, how it has shaped your journey from being a contributor to the maintainer of the project. It doesn't need to be maybe the Kubernetes, but how it has sort of the mentorship has shaped your journey from being a contributor to the point where you are now the maintainer of a specific project. Yeah, so just a quick answer for me on that. Like, so my, my journey is actually kind of interesting because I, uh, the experience I have throughout the cloud native landscape has, has always started from uh, creating a project. So I you know, have not had the benefit of being able to start through a mentorship program and like, you know, grow through one and become that. It's you know, kind of created a project from nothing and then built you know, contributors around that. Uh, so like, it's kind of like the flip for me in, in that particular scenario. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, share my experience. Um, so, but back in 2017, I was I was fortunate to work um, with a group of um, people who all contribute to open source Kubernetes, like in like most of the like 100 per, most almost 100 percent of their time um, at work. So I got a lot of uh, great mentorship and guidance on how to work on SED, how to work on Kubernetes, how to open on open source. The dynamic dynamics are different from open source to in, uh, versus internal, right? And then the relationship of SED and Kubernetes, how to always make the positive impact to the community. Um, uh, so I, I didn't really go through any of the official mentorship program. And I have to say, we didn't have those official mentorship program at the time. I was so happy to see how much resource we have right now um, to a point that navigating through those um, resources become a topic that we want to talk about today. So yeah, so we definitely have a lot of um, resource right now where you can you know, try to think of what your goal is and then uh, find the right uh, program for you. All right, um, is the mic working? Cool, sounds good to me. So. Um, I actually want to ask you something now. So you all have maybe picked a certain project at some point of time, that's correct. But when you're starting out, it's especially in the CNCF ecosystem, and if you look at the CNCF landscape, it's like a pool of projects. So a very common question that generally comes up is, how do you pick the project to start contributing to? Like, how do you pick a project? Yeah, so I can speak a little about it. Um, I think what I felt was most useful is to find a project that you will use in your daily life. It's not like, hey, I want to do open source, just choose a project and I want to contribute to it. Rather do it the other way around. If you are working in a particular vertical, if you're working in a particular area, choose something which closely, closely relates to that area. It can be related to your day job, it can be related to something that you want to pursue as a hobby. It can be something that you are just doing it for fun. But it is very important to choose a project aligning to some of your goals, because that will keep you motivated to contribute to that project and eventually grow up there. So it's a two-way street. Both need to be benefited in some way or the other. Now, just to give a personal example, how I started into Kubernetes was 
way back in 2018. I think it was Kubernetes, Kubernetes 1.11 or 1.2, something around like Kubernetes 1.10, when um, back in one of my day jobs, when we were basically running a platform, but we were running everything on like bare VMs, running uh, systemd, systemd units as jobs. Uh, we wrote our uh, orchestrator ourselves, like a simple uh, scheduler in Python, which schedules jobs across a fleet of machines. Then we thought like, oh, hey, this Kubernetes thing is shiny new. Can we leverage it somehow in our platform? That's when I started exploring Kubernetes. And since we were predominantly writing code in Python, I started looking at the Kubernetes Python client. And back in those days, the Python client was in very nascent stages. And I think when Kubernetes 1.12 was released, the client was still in like Kubernetes 1.9 or 1.8. So I thought like that's a great opportunity to come, step into the shoes of the maintainer, step into uh, the shoes of a contributor, and expedite things, and see where I do fit in, because there was a quite good amount of synergy between both the things that I was doing and why I wanted to do. Um, so that's how I started into the community, and since then, like I have explored like other areas as well. Cool, sounds good to me. Um, I, I still remember. I think there should be some kind of motivation when when you're starting contributing to a project for, and it couldn't it can't be different for any for any other person. For example, for me, when I started contributing to Kubernetes, I just got to know like there's an event called as KubeCon, and and what are the things maybe I need to do in order to attend this event KubeCon. Like, just have some motivation. And, and then I got to know, OK, maybe try to contribute to the Kubernetes project. And then, uh, then I got into the LFX mentorship and then how the thing started working. So it, it's like kind of having some role of motivation. And I think it's going to uh, give you pay forward. So having said that, now um, I specifically want to ask you some few things. So now it comes to mentorship. like. What are the some of the different mentorship programs that we specifically should be uh, exploring? I know, Jade, you are like GSOC mentor. You are LFX mentor as well. So, what are the, some of these areas like which folks starting out can uh, explore? Yeah, awesome. So, I think uh, something that's really, really important here is that you know there are a number of different categories of, of mentorship opportunities on both sides of, of the relationship. And um, and you know, we made a point earlier too is that you know a lot of us got involved in this community, this landscape, this ecosystem before uh, a, a lot of those programs were formally introduced or they became available, right? So you know we just once again another little bit of gratitude of how amazing it is that there's been so much effort put into establishing these programs and making them available um, that you know just we can continue to grow this community as a whole so that first off that's pretty that's pretty awesome so there's there's one category of mentorship opportunities here that are like the formally run programs uh, like I'm specifically thinking of Google summer of code program and then the Linux foundations like LFX uh, mentorship program so like something key to know about those programs is that you know they're very formal they're very structured so they have like a specific deadlines and dates associated with them right so there will be like for LFX mentorship there's like three terms per year um, so you have to be like if you want to take advantage of those opportunities you really have to know Know, hey, this is when I have to do the application. This is when I have to, you know, like have like the first proposal, all this sort of thing. So, like with those particular programs, they're structured, they're they're rigorous, but um, you know, so stay on top of that stuff, right? And uh, so the the Linux Foundation um, and the the CNCF specifically um, for you know this ecosystem we're more a part of is really really helpful there. Like they have some amazing staff that helps run those programs and, and, and you know administrate those programs. So they're you know they're there to kind of help make sure that the like the projects are very well defined, they're well scoped, that the you know the mentors are going to be available there. Um, so that's one category is the Google Summer of Code. LFX mentorship stuff. And then like there's more, there's some other opportunities that become like more, um, you know, more a little bit more ad hoc where they're not like it has to be this date to this date. So you can kind of pick those up uh, at random times. So you can always find opportunities there. And so, and that really becomes more of like a, uh, the projects decide themselves when they want to do things. So for instance, like, you know, uh, some projects are using Outreachy. We used that in Rook uh, a number of years back to, hey, when we had an idea, you know, we weren't constrained to, okay, we have to find the, the term two of, of you know, 2019 and fit into that box. We can say, hey, here's an opportunity. We're going to put it out there. When we find the right mentee, 
we can go in and start it, we can deliver it. So you know, there's a lot of like, opportunities throughout the year to find through programs such as Outreachy. Um, and we'll have links for this stuff at the end too, by the way. And then something that's I think really, really cool is that I think that the last count that I saw in the CNCF, there's like 160, 170 maybe projects as part of the CNCF. A lot of them aren't doing like the like, uh, strictly defined mentorship programs. A lot of them are doing it like, hey, they've got a you know, shoestring team of maintainers. Um, they don't necessarily have the time to put projects out there and define them and stuff, but they're really welcome, like welcoming the help to come in. So you, if you find a project that you care about, go there, check it out, talk to the you know, maintainers on their Slack or their Discord or whatever, and there's almost guaranteed to be some mentorship opportunities there as well. Um, and then there's some Kubernetes, specifically for Kubernetes project as well, that I think that there's some things that, do you wanna go ahead and talk about that? Um, so in addition to everything that Jared talked talked about. We do have a few more things that we do really well structured in the Kubernetes community, but are really not time bound, but we do them as like goal oriented or goal bound. Um, one of them is like group mentoring cohorts. So SIG Contribex helps uh, other SIGs and areas in the community to run mentoring cohorts. Um, so we help them set up the cohort by um, running the incoming form for mint applications. We help them like set up the framework. We help them set up meetings. And the end goal of this group mentoring is needed to be quite well defined before we even start with the mentoring and also the requirements for a mentee to join the group mentoring cohorts. Um, a few examples I can give are um, six CLI did uh, a mentoring cohort, uh, if I remember last year. Um, la Last to last year, Machi is here, who ran. Oh, nice. Um, one of those cohorts for bringing in more maintainers to kubectl. Um, SIG Contribex did a lead mentoring cohort to find new Contribex leads, which I was a part of. So there are various kinds of mentoring cohorts that we uh, enable the community with. And it's not just the Kubernetes community, if any any other uh, CNCF project wants help from us, we are more than open to like help them set up such programs. Sounds, okay. Sounds good to me. Um, Carol, do you have anything to add? Because um, I remember like uh, there was a part of like, when you're contributing to a project, there are like two different areas you can explore. Either you can come into the coding part if you're interested in contributing to the, maybe the code side of things, and then maybe if you're interested I want to contribute to the documentation. So that comes under the non-coding part of things. So Carol, would you like to maybe mention a few things about the same? Like how do you figure this thing out? Yeah, uh, I can share my experience. How can I start? Uh, I think, uh, for example, in each group dependent, uh, the, the maintainers uh, could be also a mentors. Sometimes, uh, for example, this is like that is happening with the Spanish localizations. We try to everyone that is going to try to create a pull request to try to guide to guide uh, because we have not so many people. I think it's not the, the case for all the projects because in other projects they have a lot of uh, people that uh, are creating several issues that it's impossible that three people uh, try to mentor. But in our case, uh, we can't. And I think it depends at the end of the persons because uh, at the end is everything about our relationships. So you have to write, uh, you have to ask the questions. And also the people, uh, the mentor that answer, you have to feel if it's the answer that you, you understand. Sometimes we have some difficulties, even for our culture to understand the, the, the way that the people may maybe say, you don't get it. <laughs> and you have, you, can ask for another people, and that will be the way that you can continue. Because uh, that was the way that I keep like two or three years, because at the end I am like a friendship for the, the maintainers that I ask, and when I come to this uh, events like KubeCon, I can meet more people and talk and create a relationship that help me 
to ask questions in the Slack in the, in the, next, in the next other months and also to be motivated. Like right now, for example, uh, I am very motivated with localizations and some CI CD scripts that also being uh, documentation part of the non-coding, they have some technical also issues that it depends if you want to get to the job and try to uh, look some problems because uh, yeah, we have several problems in, in all the, the projects and I think the most difficult part is that uh, see the relations between others, even with the other projects and the maintainers. Uh, but it's just be patient and try to ask questions and try to, right now you are here and try to uh, talk with the people and create this first relationship and what you want, what would you like to do? Sounds good. Um, I actually want to mention a little, little bit of OutIF. So, like, in the Kubernetes project, you, for, like, SIGDOCS is the main uh, SIG that contributes to the docs. So, in order to um, provide mentorship to maybe the contributors to the SIG docs, they generally have something called as maybe the PR Wrangler program that eventually assigns a certain kind of mentor who will be reviewing, who will be helping a certain mentee reviewing some kind of PRs on the docs side. So that is one of the things which I personally like about the SIG docs thing. Um, having said that, I think Jade, you mentioned about like a lot of. Uh, uh, mentorship programs. I just want to mention one more thing here. Like um, a lot of times, as a mentee, uh, I have seen when I talk to other mentees as well. Uh, when they contribute to a project, they aim to get selected in these programs. Like the aim is to get selected in these programs. But I think as a mentee, your your aim should be to contribute to this project because these mentorship uh, projects, are, uh, mentorship sorry, programs have been created with the purpose to stick contributors to the project over a longer period of time. So even if you get selected to a project and you leave after the mentorship is over, I don't think so. It, it did some, you did something good for the project because you eventually left. It could be due to certain reasons, but the main reason is like they want you to stick to the project over a longer period of time and take the, the ladder, contribution ladder to the higher level. Having said that, now I talked about the contribution ladder. So when you contribute to a project, you have certain kind of stages. Like when you contribute, you're first of all like a contributor, and then you become the member of a project, and then you become a reviewer, approver, and then like the maintainer. So having said that, now my question would be to the mentors is like, um, how do you actually grow in this open source project where you have like different, different, multiple contributor ladder stages? Wenji, would you like to answer that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I'm familiar with Kubernetes and SCD projects, so I'll take this to as a uh, example. I'm sure like different projects probably have different governance and uh, contributor letters, but uh, in Kubernetes, uh, the the um, the entry level is member. If you contribute, and then you have two supporters, and you have some artifact, and then you can be a Kubernetes member, and then. Uh, the next level is reviewers and then uh, approvers where like when you approve something it can be merged and then the next level is sub project leader and then um, the sig leader um, so uh, I, I think how do you grow in this um, letter it, it's very important for you to understand what your expectation is what's your goal right uh, uh, for b different people, you come from different places, uh, and when we mentioned some people like need to contribute to open source because of it's part of your job, and then some people contribute to co open source because it's interesting, it, it's like um, their personal uh, choice. Um, so what's your goal? And then after that, set up like, understand your commitment level, like how much time you can put into it, and then uh, with that set, um, just get your hands dirty, like start to contribute. Um, and as I mentioned, the, between all these letters, um, I think um, I see like at the beginning of the talk, I see we do have some people who haven't started the contribution yet. I think though for those people, like some of the mentorship program is like going to be super helpful. And I know uh, it probably some of them are selective but you don't have to be selected into those programs to contribute to open source. Um, just watch YouTube uh, videos and go to the uh, new contributor orientations and just participate in SIG meetings um, and start to pick up the help wanted the tickets and just 
you know, um, fixed typos, fixed fix unit tests, fixed docs, um, shadow releases, anything you can do is, you know, could help you get more familiar with uh, from zero to one. And then I think a lot of people uh, uh, are stuck at from one to ten, right? Like when you you are already a member, and how to be more, you know, uh, better expertise at certain area. And um, surprisingly, like we do have a, like other than all this official programs, I have like we have actually a lot of different mentorship program like locally in different six that's open to you know everyone like it's 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 uh, um, there are more opportunities than you know of um, just you um, just participate in the meetings um, just try to I, I had like all, among all the Kubernetes six I have never heard any six saying that we have too many people people contributing um, like <laughs> stop um, like every like all the t six leads want more people to contribute so just talk to those people see like see these are the PRs that I've been doing and then I want to contribute more is there a specific area that you need more people to have expertise on, and if you do, can we like establish a mentorship program? Like we can do that too. So um, I just want to say, like based on your expectation and your commitment, um, find the right opportunity. Sounds good. Um, I want to mention this thing. I think docs is one of the like one of the again com common questions is like. Even if I start contributing to a project, how should I raise my first PR? And what after the things, even after I have raised my first PR? So to answer this like very common question on how do you raise the first PR, I was just yesterday talking to the Argo maintainers on how do you debug this Argo CD uh, project locally? How do you run these components locally? And he mentioned about their steps, like this is what they do. And then my simple question to them was like, has this process been documented somewhere? And they were like, no. So that's like an opportunity, like you learn something and you feel like, okay, uh, this is something that maybe can be documented to a certain part of project, do it. That's like your way to contribute to your project and you did that. Um, having said that, I think we have a lot of time left. So um, I think Venjay, you already asked who are the members in this, uh, in the project, who are the reviewers and who are the approvers who have been contributing to the project. But it's an open to all questions and we'd like, to the, we'd like the mentors to answer this question for you. So I have a question to audience and I would like to uh, maybe answer, get an answer from them. So um, what are the, some of the typical hurdles and pitfalls to grow in your contributor ladder from maybe from members to reviewers and to approvers. I know a lot of you have been contributing and maybe a lot of you have been members, but what are the, some of the typical hurdles have you faced while contributing or have you some uh, like typical hurdles that you have faced? Would you like anyone to uh, speak up for that? We have two microphones there and I can also hand off microphones oh, if anyone my Oh, there's mic. Um, one of the things we struggle with is getting people to review code. Um, we get a lot of PRs and getting the, the approvers to review them all is, is just a struggle. Um, so uh, there's no barrier to say uh, that you're, if you're not an approver, you can't review code. Getting people just coming in and reviewing other people's code without a special badge, there's no special hat for it. That's a, a thing that we would like to know how to make that happen, I suppose, and yeah. Yeah, I think that's a classic problem for, you know, probably all 160 projects in the CNCF that we were talking about, right? Um, there's two things I can think of to help out with that. Um, one of them is um, I have found a a good percentage of, of contributions, you know, technical contributions, code contributions that come into a project are the motivation is going to be that somebody wants a new feature or somebody wants something, you know, that's missing in the project, right? And so um, a lot of times they'll make that contribution, but they won't necessarily 
help the reviewers to help themselves, right? So uh, something that we've we've done and we've tried to reinforce a lot, which then you know has the downstream implication of reducing the burden on reviewers, is to, like you know to for the contributor when they're opening a PR to do some of that legwork to you know kind of not just justify why they're doing something, but like. Why is this quality as well? How has this been tested? What are the risky areas to call out? So you know, if you have someone's like updated this because blah, like oh, well, okay. As a as a reviewer, I can look at that. Well, I don't have time to dig into why you know the details of that. So I'm just going to go to the next PR that has a lot more details there. So that's one thing is encouraging your contributors to uh, really kind of add the details and, and help help it get reviewed. Uh, some of that burdens on them, so that has that help. And then the other thing is incentives as well. Uh, so you know, like uh, we do something for every release. We have like a release MVP uh, program there, and so um, you know that kind of helps people dig in a little bit more, chop wood, carry water, review more PRs, etc. So somebody could be like, hey, this is the re release MVP here because they reviewed you know six or seven PRs here. And then this is kind of the span going up to feature freeze there. So incentivizing people, kind of rewarding them to do those reviews also helps get through our backlog too. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to say we don't have a backlog. We have one too. <laughs> Can I just ask before you, um, how, how frequently do you release then if you're doing it, managing to an MVP kind of program? Yeah. We do qu quarterly releases, so every, every three months. Okay. Yeah, I just want to add that it's a great question that it happen everywhere. And then as in SED, that's basically the motivation uh, of our first cohort of mentorship program, because we only have two tech lead, two chairs, and then we don't have a lot of you know experienced community contributor at the time. And then we want to grow the next generation of uh, you know senior leads in the in the community. Um, so, like long term, I think each six have their own plan of how to make this sustainable, scalable, uh, to help people like you who want to, you know, make more contributions, but like got stuck at just a reviewing, right? Um, so, so we are all working on it, and at the same time, I think it's also like a good thing for even the beginners to do, just to start to review other people's PRs. Like you don't have to approve the PR, you can review it, and then you can observe how other people review other people's PR and learn from it, and then the next time your PR will be you know, easier to get past, and then you can um, offload the maintainer's you know, uh, reviewing load, and then they have time to review yours. Thank you. Anything else? It can't be that easy. <laughs> um, we, we run across two issues. Uh, one is that the contributors will come and uh, we'll do like the men mentorship. We did the LFX mentorship, for example. And they came and they did the mentorship and then they went off and did another project. So keeping them, which I think someone mentioned. Um, so tapping into what their motivations are and sort of supporting their professional uh, growth um, is good feedback. And the other component is that our contributing uh, guides become outdated. So <laughs> they're ready, you know, for one round or one cohort of mentors and then within a year they need to be updated again and we don't always have the, the, the folks to continue to update them and so then that makes it harder for new contributors to come on. So those are ongoing issues for our projects. Yeah, I have one question. Um, so from your experience, I'd love to learn more about what you think the main motives usually are. Um, for people who actually want to climb that ladder, right? Because climbing that ladder comes with more um, responsibilities, right? Um, and from my viewpoint, they could either be in intrinsically motivated or be motivated by other factors. Maybe they work at a company where having a badge of honor, being a maintainer, can play a role in performance evaluations. So from your experience, I'm curious to know what you would say are the main motives for people who want to actually climb that ladder. Yeah, I want to mention the incentives. Like, I am a, a manager in Google, so I understand that performance thing. Like, uh, I just want to say I am always happy to write like a performance justification for anyone in the community. Like, if you contribute to FCD, if you contribute to Kubernetes, I understand the impact. I'm happy to write uh, things for you. And I've asked uh, open source communities members who are not working for Google to help me write performance, you know, feedback for my uh, reports. 
Um, so we understand, like, um, like it basically encourage everybody to uh, contribute more to the open source. And then you can come, come to us and say, I want to work on an impactful project, and then um, this is why I can do good on it, and then we can help you. All right, I think we have only one minute left. Do we have any more equation so far? Do we have? Yeah, so I kind of want to build upon um, that last point with like performance evaluations. Um, something I feel like I've ran into working at various companies is um, it, they get, it, it becomes a little bit opaque to leadership to see like, um, I guess like the value like in a metric of like what they're contributing. So I'm, I'm just curious if there's like, um, if, if we're thinking about any sort of like systematic ways to like give that feedback back to companies and show like, hey, you're actually saving your business a lot of money like um, using these tools and also like having people come and contribute and like this performance eval like is meaningful to like the end business. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I don't, I'm not sure about like the, uh, like the profit thing. That's probably like secret for different companies, but I, we can do like uh, the performance, like for example, a PR that you submit help the SCD performance going a lot bigger and we can show the, 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 the graph and stuff. And also uh, from last KubeCon, I think it's, there are some company mentioned like the company incentives. Team Hawking said, um, talk to him, ask him to talk to your leads. So he said that, I'll just repeat, like let Team Hawking know that your manager is not supporting and he probably could do something. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I think we are out of time now, but uh, we'll be hanging around here. And here's a feedback uh, QR, so you probably can scan and maybe provide a feedback on how was this panel for. And I hope you all have a very nice KubeCon going so far, and we'll see you around. Thank you, for everyone, for joining in.